Hello, everybody. My name is Alex. I'm a reporter and editor at TechCrunch and a climate tech enthusiast, you might say. Today, we have a panel of three investors, all of whom are active in the climate tech invest investing space. And we're going to take a look at startups that are being built in the area, why, and also do a lot of work on who is writing checks in the Series A and B level and why they are doing that. But to kick things off, instead of me introducing every single person by name and trying to tell you where they invest, I'm going to let them say hi and tell us where they're currently writing checks and give you kind of the details about where they actually put money to work. So to kick things off, Rajesh Kosla, tell us about you. Absolutely. Uh, we invest uh, out of three, four investment vehicles. Uh, we have a $400 million seed fund. Uh, we write two to $7 million checks. We have a billion dollar main fund. We write anywhere from five to $30 million checks. We have an opportunity fund to write $50 million checks. Uh, so it's across the spectrum, but we like to come in really early, continue to invest in these high impact uh, companies. All right, thank you. And then Shale, tell us about EIP and tell us also why your plants are better than what Rajesh has on his desk. My plants are better than what Rajesh... I'm going to start with the most important part thank of that question. Yes. My plants are better than what Rajesh has on his desk because my wife takes care of them. Uh, we did briefly try where I was in control of my own plants and it was not a success. I'm, I'm good at growing hot peppers, but I've discovered that's the only thing that I can grow. Um, Less relevant, uh, yeah, so EIP is, we have about $3 billion under management in total across a number of different funds with different strategies. We invest everywhere from very early stage to growth stage. Where I focus is in what we call our frontier fund, which is our uh, deep tech climate fund. So in our fund, we invest anywhere typically from sort of 5 to $15 million initial checks with fairly wide error bars on both sides of that spectrum, uh, anywhere from seed to series B, and the mandate is deep tech plus climate. All right. And then Mona, over to you. Round us off. Where do you invest and where does your firm put money to work? Yeah. So I'm uh, Mona. I'm part of the investment team at Union Square Ventures. Uh, we've been around since 2003, historically known for our internet and software investing, which we do from the core fund and the opportunity fund. And then in 2020, we launched a dedicated climate fund. And that fund is early stage. So we do seed, series A. And um, yeah, our check sizes are anywhere from 1 million to 7, 8 million. And we lead or co-lead. And we invest in anything climate, really. We, don't, we will look at it all. <laughs> And we are going to get into the uh, the hardware software conversation uh, in a little bit. But I want to start from a high level because I've been watching the news in the last couple of weeks, and I did catch quite a lot about a hurricane that came through Florida. And I couldn't help but sitting there wondering if that sort of climate event, if you will, or climate influenced event is actually driving more and more founders into building companies that you guys might consider. So uh, Mona, with you, are you seeing an influx of founder interest into the climate tech space as we see our planet uh, perhaps change more rapidly than we'd like? Yeah, absolutely. And I think at USV, because we invest in climate and non-climate, so I could see the contrast in terms of talent flowing into different sectors. And certainly we see it way more in climate. Um, we keep track of, for example, the senior management team at our portfolio company, what they do after they leave. A lot of them, they say they want to go and build in climate. Um, and also what's interesting is you see people from across all sectors and walks of life wanting to get into climate. In the past, I felt there was this uh, sense that you need to be an engineer or a scientist to build in climate. But now many people are just taking whatever skill set they have or experience they have and trying to apply it to climate, which is, um, which is great. And then, Rajesh, same question over to you. Curious about Coastal's perspective, given that you guys also have a long history of investing outside of the climate space. So you probably also have that dual perspective that USV does. Yeah, uh, that's certainly true. It's not just uh, what is happening in Florida, what happened in Florida uh, with the EM, uh, what is happening in Russia. So all of that is playing a role into how, so how, how much people realize how, urgent, how much urgency exists in terms of making the climate impact. So we see a lot of people wanting to come not just from the prior industries in climate tech, like solar and batteries, now wanting to come into things like hydrogen direct air capture, but also people coming wanting to come from the oil and gas industry into things like geothermal, because there's a lot of relevant experience. And climate really needs people with a lot of leadership skills. So people who have gone and built even consumer device companies, even life sciences companies, want to be coming to climate and make a huge difference. So we're certainly seeing the trend, and that's a very healthy trend. 
And uh, we're going to get back to the leadership point a little bit later on, so hold on to that thought. Now, Shale, EIP, a bit more climate-focused. Uh, there are all these generalist investor and firms kind of moving into the space. I'm curious how the pace of that has changed in the last, say, 12 or 18 months, as it really does seem there's been a kind of a consciousness raising about caring and building in the climate tech space. I think it's actually been kind of an interesting... Uh, period for I'd say the past like three to four years because we've had we're probably three and a half years into this like climate tech boom that started a few years ago with a bunch of generalist investors getting in, interested in the space and a bunch more new specialist investors getting involved in the space or doubling down if they were already involved and so there's been this big wave of capital inflows into the into the market uh, some of that has pulled back as the macro environment has deteriorated a little bit and I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing I think you know there's enough new capital in the market that it's you can, you can capitalize great companies now there's no question about that but investors who are looking at it because it was the next big thing like there was a brief period of time i would say 12 months ago when a bunch of investors who were like considering oh should i like spend more time on web3 or climate <laughs> right not to say well, that not each of those things don't have their own merits but that was people who were considering it because it was a hot sector not because of its merits that stand alone so i think now we're back in this world where like People who are dedicating time and effort and capital to climate um, are putting in the time that it takes to really understand how this market is evolving. And I think that's generally speaking a good thing. Yeah, I don't find it kind of ironic that people might be weighing Web3 on one hand, thanks to proof of work, which can drive climate change, and then on the other hand, investing in climate. Um, Mona, USV has investments in both sides of that. Um, I, I'm curious about how the market volatility we've seen in general might be impacting how your firm invests in climate tech. Has has overall market volatility led to you guys being more or less active in terms of writing perhaps net new checks into the space? So for us, um, we haven't slowed down or stopped investing. I think the one thing, the general trend I'm noticing is people taking their time, which is actually might be a good thing because for a period early this year and last year, you have one week or two weeks to do due diligence and then you have to yeah, decide. But now we can be a bit more deliberate and, and thoughtful about researching and understanding spaces and companies. Um, we're seeing actually a shift also in terms of the generalist fund. For us, we have a dedicated climate fund, so we're sort of a different case, but other sure. generalist funds that have different allocation for different sectors, actually um, restructuring um, that and moving more capital towards climate. Because in this risky environment, obviously climate is not immune, but it's still less risky than, for example, crypto or um, other investments. So we're seeing that shift as well, um, but definitely at a slower pace um, and everyone is slowing down. I'm curious mm -hmm. if Shale and Raj experience the same. Rajesh, you want to jump in there? Yeah, sure. Um, we have a 10-year horizon on climate. Um, so the six months, one year kind of volatility should really not matter. It should not influence where we invest in. I would, If I look at our portfolio, we've had a lot of overnight successes in companies like QuantumScape, solid-state batteries, Lanzajet aviation fuels, Impossible Foods. But these were all kind of 10 years in the making, right? So you need that kind of a horizon to be able to find these companies, continue to nurture them through you know, good and bad times. So we really don't think of it from that perspective as to, you know, should we slow down? So we've been having one to two new investments a month. So that's, that's been a very steady pace. This is on top of the existing, you know, very healthy portfolio that we already have. So we're not going to slow down. We're not going to significantly accelerate because everybody is jumping in. We're going at the right pace in terms of investing in these companies. And then, Cheryl, over to you. I presume the answer is steady as she goes, but I thought I'd bring you in just to make sure that market volatility isn't changing the EIP playbook too much. No, I mean, similarly, similar to what Rajesh said, and I would say in, in my context, maybe even a more extreme version of that, which is, you know, what we're betting on in this frontier fund are the, the technologies and companies that we think are going to be fundamental to a path to net zero globally, right? And that is a multi-decade trend. We're going to be doing that for the next 20, 30 years. And so if we bet right on the companies that can play a role across that entire transition, then to Rajesh's point, it doesn't matter what the market is doing tomorrow. Now, it does matter if that company can scale fast enough and raise the next round of capital that's going to need to raise. So I don't mean to pretend that we're not 
paying attention to it, but fundamentally it does not change the investment thesis for us and it does not change the pace at which we want to invest. I want to talk a little bit about that 10-year time frame and kind of what is venture backable. Because when I consider climate tech investing, there's two things that are really at play for me from where I sit. One is building cool companies that tackle big problems and generate outsized returns for investors like yourselves. And then also the fact that we're working on the planet. We're not doing monkey JPEGs or another B2B SaaS company that's going to help marketing teams at Fortune 500 companies be slightly more efficient. It, it, it's kind of a bigger a bigger problem, Shale. So when you guys are making investments, choosing between different companies, do you let you know impacts to the planet help kind of influence your decisions? Or is it trying to essentially profit maximize inside of a space that you know will have some positive impacts? I guess it's closer to the latter of the two options you described. The way that I think about it is, for us, climate is a, it's, it, within this fund, it is a filter at the front end, right? So it is, will this company at scale, if it is successful, have a massive impact on decarbonization? If the answer is no, it's just not a fit for this fund. In EIP's flagship fund, which is later stage, it may still be if it has a big positive impact on the energy transition. So for example, in that fund, we've invested in a bunch of cybersecurity companies, which are super impactful, but not climate. Uh, within what I'm doing, climate is a is a hard filter. But I think of it as being a hard filter, both just because of the mandate in the fund and because we have a fundamental belief that getting from 50 gigatons of CO2 emissions, that's 50 billion tons a year of CO2 today, to net zero CO2 by 2050 or earlier is a monumental economic transformation globally. And if a company can contribute substantially to that transition, it will have outsized economic returns. So it's both a fund fit criterion and for me it's a useful heuristic for can this thing be a really big thing yeah so mona the 50 gigaton co2 emissions thing might be the biggest tam or almost like anti-tam because you want to kind of get rid of it i've ever heard of but the same question to you about balancing uh hope for returns and also impacts to the planet so at the sv even in the core fund and the climate fund um we don't really focus too much on exit potential. We want to build long lasting companies. It's not even a component in our investment memo is like what the exit is going to look like. And then when it comes to investing and thinking about the climate impact, there is a balance between um, urgency in responding to the climate crisis and thinking of system level long term change. And we do try to balance both. For example, like we invest in e-fuel, um, that's still not available at scale now, but we want to be on the learning rate to get it to a cost competitive option. And then we also invest in other solutions that are, for example, drop in fuel using waste um, that could be deployed and at scale quite earlier than e-fuels, for example. So it's more about a balanced portfolio. Um, we think climate the climate is a crisis now, and we need to respond to that urgency, but also we need to plan like long term. Yeah. And it's reflected in our investments. All right. So I want to narrow down to what we've been asked to really discuss, which is kind of the Series A and Series B level. And Rajesh, in the old days, it was pretty clear what a Series A was. First institutional capital, there was a relatively tight kind of dollar range people would think about. Valuations were not standardized, but common. There was kind of a band, if you will. Things have, have changed dramatically. So when, when Coastal considers a Series B or a Series A investment into the climate tech space, which is broad, sector-wise, um, how do you differentiate between the two? Are there a particular benchmark? you look for, maturity levels, technology points. I want to start to kind of cut them apart, if you will. Yeah, so at a high level, I don't want to pick a number. We look at it as, you know, the number, the money that you raise should be a function of a couple of things. Where you are in terms of de-risking the technology, how much you can de-risk over the next kind of 12 to 24 months on mm -hmm. the most critical area you need to de-risk de -risk, to show that this is a technology that's viable, that's a product market uh, fit, you're de-risking some of the critical items. And then it's a function of who are the kind of right investor or syndicate you can pull together and the kind of team that you can attract. So think through these things and then say, what is the right number for me to pick at this point so I can create value for the company over the next you know, one and a half, two and a half years versus chasing the total dollar raise because the money is available or significantly lowering that amount because the macro is bad. So pick the right number, go with the right set of investors and focus on the right de-risking plan that automatically determines you know, what that money should be. 
that, that's how at least we like to think about it. No, that's, that's totally fine. Shell, I want to bring you in on this. You mentioned having 3 billion AUM, so quite a lot of capital experience. Um, are, are there any important distinctions between Series A's and Series B's, or should we consider them just to be earlier stage climate tech investments and they'll break down you know, by individual sector? I think it depends a lot on the type of company. Sure. You'll see some some markets in which it's possible to find product market fit, have revenue, have customers, be in growth mode after the Series A, maybe even before the Series A in some cases, right? So by the time the Series B hits, you're valued on very different metrics, you look like a very different business. There's a question as to like how efficiently you can scale. Yeah. There are other businesses, particularly in in deep tech world, where you go into the Series B and perhaps well beyond before you've ever introduced a product into the market. Right, and those are the businesses that have longer time horizons, require more capital, ultimately, and so there's a trade-off there, obviously, uh, and you have to really believe that the prize is worth the cost for those businesses. If you're going to raise more capital, take more time, go through a, a much more difficult process before you ever have your first customer and your first dollar of revenue, uh, then the the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow has to be commensurately larger. Rajesh, I see you waving your hand, and I consider this to be something you wanted to talk about, so go ahead and jump in here. Yeah, I was just moving it on, but I will wave my hand and, and give you a comment. Uh, just give you an example of, there was a company I was talking to, uh, they never built even a prototype or tested at the beaker level, uh, but they were trying to raise a $50 million because they want to go and build a small plant to, to de-risk the entire product. So that's the kind of difficult one you shouldn't be chasing because it forces you to focus on scale rather than de-risking the early stage stuff that you should be. So there, it makes sense in terms of what the small amount needs to be so you de-risk. Exactly to Shale's point, it's a function of what that company is, what are you trying to de-risk, what market are you focusing on? There is a different number for different companies. Yeah. So to, to me, listening to this, it, it feels like the differentiation between how rounds are set up may break down along kind of a hardware software axis. Because in, in the software world, tech risk is lower, I think, generally speaking. And those companies are relatively metricized. We all know how SaaS works. So it sounds like more on the on the climate, sorry, on the hardware side, uh, Mona, that it's a little bit squishier what's an A, what's a B, depending on the time horizon of the company in question and also the capital needs uh, thereof. Um, so for ESG, we invest in both hardware and software, and it's a lot of the time sector specific as well, and the type of company, um, yeah, just the timeline. These are all determine different types of valuations and what seed is and what Series A. Um, but I guess for the software investments, we for hardware investments, we accept to see um, some proof of uh, feasibility. Mm -hmm. We don't take on any science risks, but we are willing to take engineering risks. Um, so we do that. If there's an engineering risk, that would probably be at the C, it's Series A. We probably wouldn't do it at the Series B and unless it's nuclear or, yeah. And then for the software side, we expect to see some metrics on performance, traction, um, and generally overall for both software and hardware, we like to have the companies have the smallest, basically what's the minimal amount of work you could do to get to deploy. Because when you deploy, it's not just about being um, generating revenue or being, it's more about like when you are in the real world, you get a lot more lessons and insights from customers and sure. you iterate and work better on, on your product. Um, so yeah, that's a high level answer. No, I appreciate that. The difficulty with Series A's and B's in the climate tech space is simply how broad those two categories are. And the fact that climate tech applies to energy generation, decarbonization, food production, it, it's almost like the phrase fintech in that it's it's so almost all inclusive that I almost want to break it into like eight or nine smaller subcategories. Um, but I do yeah. think, oh, please. Sorry, Mona. No, I was going to say, I fully agree with you. For me, I always think climate tech is not really a sector, but a new way to look at the economy. Hmm. So every sector could be a climate sector and will be at some point. Or will be and won't admit to it, perhaps, given that yeah. some things do have a greater than average impact. Like I, I was thinking about the news the other week that uh, Trip Actions is going to go public. They facilitate corporate travel. How much are they focused, for example, on the climate in impacts of us flying around more to go to stuff versus sitting here like we are right now, chatting over the internet? Um, to me, everything's going to have a climate edge to it. And so... I wonder if in time everyone's going to be a climate investor, just like every single SaaS company ends up having a fintech component in some time. Um, five years is kind of my guess, Shale, until that's, uh, that's kind of standard language. 
I guess. I think about it similarly, I guess, but the way that I think about it is more like cloud mm. in the sense that, I mean, yes, cloud is sort of a sector of its own, but really the impacts of the cloud transition have been to transform a bunch of other sectors. And that's what climate is, right? It's not, it's not that every company is going to be a climate company. It's that the climate problem <laughs> crosses most of the economy, right? Like emissions come from, as you said, like most emissions in the world are energy, transportation, buildings, food and agriculture, and industry, right? Add those five up and you've got the majority of the economy. I've tried to think about what are the sectors that basically aren't, that are major sectors of the economy but are not major contributors to climate change. It's basically pharmaceuticals as far as I can come up with. <laughs> so most sectors are, right? And so that means that like every one of those sectors in a different way is going to have to fundamentally transform if we're going to mitigate climate change. And so climate is this like overarching challenge that all these sectors face. Um, so it's more thematic than it is sectoral. I agree with Mona. It's not actually a sector. It's a convenient way to talk about this theme. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. I, I want to talk about um, capital sources, though. We have about 10 minutes left, so I want to make sure we hit on this. Um, Rajesh, we're sitting here with uh, some venture capitalists. We're talking about venture capital and startups and founders and so forth. But there is other money out there. There's grants. There's uh, large funds putting more money to work in kind of ESG efforts. And so when you're talking to to founders that are raising a Series A and B in this space, uh, are you emphasizing other places they can go out and collect capital, perhaps to augment around or perhaps replace one entirely? Yeah, um, it, look, climate is going to take a village uh, to solve the problem that we have. I mean, we look at it as there are 700 million people in the world having a rich lifestyle and 7, pe 7 billion people are aspiring for it. And to get there, you need to innovate on food, energy, environment, buildings, all of that stuff needs to happen, right? So so for that to come together, there is a significant more pool of capital that needs to happen than just, you know, VCs around the table and across the world. So there's definitely, you know, the Inflation Reduction Act has been a big pull for, for a lot of new investors to come in, for more private money to come in. A lot of government initiatives are coming in across the world, not just in the U.S., more coming in Europe, Asia, and so on. So you should be looking at all kinds of capital. There are pros and cons to taking a different kind of capital, depending on what stage of your round are. So founders should be looking at all kinds of capital and we strongly encourage, we work with a lot of those different types of capital to bring that pool of money into our companies. All right. I want to stick with this theme, but I want to be slightly rude about certain investors because we have the venue to do it. Uh, during the 2020, 2021, kind of like peak of the last venture startup cycle, there was a lot of money that kind of came in to startup investing that was later than dismissed as tourist money once it went away. And sure, I am talking about Tiger and that's fine. Um, Mona, are, are, are the generalist investors that are dipping a toe into climate investing, are they putting in the, the work they need to do to fully understand? Or are we seeing a lot of um, tourist-ish money flow into the space, perhaps backing companies that are less efficient with that capital or maybe making wrong bets entirely? Yeah, I don't want to speak for other journalist funds, but I guess I could speak to um, USV. So we view it in two things. Sure. One is... Um, we like to partner with specialist investors. We think the experience they have and the decades that they put into it, um, we understand, we're aware that we can't just come in as generalists and replace all of that or learn it all in two or three years. So for us, the best investing we do, and because our funds are quite small as well, is to partner and lead or co-lead with specialist climate funds. And we've been doing that in the majority of our deals. Um, so that's the first thing. And the second thing is, I guess it hits to the point we talked about earlier, because climate is not a sector, but a new way to look at the economy. I think the generalist point of view is helpful when the generalist investor is serious about the mission and about just the climate crisis broadly, because we see many things. We can draw different parallels. We can help um, companies think broader, bigger, connect with different types of customers, uh, think about different type of products that maybe a specialist investor who is focused in quite a niche area want to be able to, to get that broader exposure. But um, yeah, I think surely you will see money coming in to climate, leaving climate, generalist, and um, yeah. No, I appreciate that. I want to get through a couple more quick things before we run out of time. Um, Rajesh, the university to founder pipeline. We talk about this in areas like artificial intelligence and a lot of other areas. Uh, I presume that there is a relatively robust pipeline of academics into the world of, of climate tech. Are those people finding the resources they need to build the companies that they might be able to, or are they more being absorbed into existing entities? 
No, I think, the, look, when the whole climate investment stopped over the last 10 years, to your point of tourists, when a lot of tourists came into clean tech 1.0 and went away, yep. certainly the universities continue to work on that, right? So now we're seeing, you know, finally some of those great ideas coming back into the market. So there's definitely a healthy pipeline coming up from not just in the Bay Area, Stanford's and Berkeley's of the world, but East Coast, you know, great innovations happening in UK, Europe, uh, you know, Singapore, New Zealand, and we've been investing in all those areas. So I think there is a healthy pipeline. It's about, you know, finding the right entrepreneur, you know, bringing the right leadership team to those companies, helping them build a team, all of that stuff needs to happen. Cheryl, same question over to you. How much uh, time does EIP go looking for very early stage companies or even ideas at the university level that could later on raise these series A's and B's that we're talking about? A fair bit. I mean, I think it's also just a great place to get great ideas, right? And so we spend a lot of time engaging with those groups. I think the other thing that's nice in climate that has emerged and is becoming increasingly powerful is uh, organizations that are sort of built to help bring ideas out of the lab and into the market. So take from a government standpoint, places like RPE, which has been like a foundry for um, dozens of really important uh, climate technologies and companies. Even the private sector, there's stuff like Activate and organizations that basically help entrepreneurs entrepreneurs who come from a science background turn their idea into a business. And there's there's a bunch of those types of things emerging that I think are really helpful um, so that, you know, there's some hand-holding if you're trying to go straight from a government, or sorry, a university lab into, into venture capital world. All right. And so, oh, please. SOS to, add, SOS to add to the mix. Yes. Uh, I believe that's I thought that was implied. <laughs> <Obviously. laughs> that's right. Our, our hosts are active, and I would call it their hacks program, and uh, I think Indie Bio as well. So if you want to check those out, uh, I'm sure SOSV would not mind the uh, the Google clicks. So feel free. Um, there was about five billion in Series A money put into climate tech in 2021, maybe around eight billion at the Series B level. It depends on which data set you look at, but call it 13 billion last year in this space. And when I think about the scale of the, of the stuff we're talking about, from construction to decarbonization to travel to food to industry, it, it seems like not nearly enough money. And so I'm curious if my, my pessimism is misplaced, but I, I almost wonder if we would be better off putting more capital to work with uh, working on how to live with a changed planet than to get to what Shale is shooting for, which is net zero by 2050 or earlier. So. Are, is there enough money going on to actually make that happen? Or are we doing kind of a drop in the bucket, Mona, against a, a oncoming flood? I think it's good that you are, we are seeing capital flowing um, and hopefully we will get more of it because we need it. Um, I don't think it's an option to just focus on adaptation and how to live with it. We need to work on not just reducing emissions, but also if you look at any IPCC report, we also need to remove carbon. Like carbon removal is not debatable anymore. It needs to be included in, I mean, every scenario you look at at the IPCC, they include carbon removal. Another thing I wanted to mention within the context of funding as well, which I find quite frustrating, is all of this capital, including the early stage VC or growth or infrastructure um, finance goes toward developed markets. I was reading yeah. something in the Climate uh, Tech VC newsletter where only 5% of all VC funding from last year to climate went to emerging markets and developing countries. Um, and to me, it's, um, it's really unfortunate because some of these countries are already experiencing the impact of climate change and within the limited amount of money that's going to climate broadly, not enough, not as much as we need, even less is going to emerging markets. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's, um, it's great that we have the IRA, that we have everything, and hopefully we see more of it. But, um, yeah, we definitely need more, and we need it to be equally distributed as well. All right, before we do a, a quick lightning round of favorite companies for people to go and look at, um, Rajesh, tell me why my pessimism is misplaced. Because the urgency is very high, uh, and there is there are people jumping in over the last six to nine months, really trying to figure out where they should invest. It's not a question of if and how much money. It's a question of how and how quickly and where you deploy it the right way. Yeah. Uh, versus you know dumping too much capital in the wrong companies. So it needs to be done right, but we do need a lot of money to address this problem. Well, I am at my heart a capitalist, and so I'm uh, I'm encouraged by the optimism here. I hope that I'm proven wrong because I would like to leave uh, a better world to not just my kids, but our kids, you know? So thank you for that. And we only have a minute or two left. So I want to go ahead and go around and ask everyone, um, 
just the name of a climate tech company. It can be anywhere in the broader world or theme um, that you think is either very, very interesting because it's a financial success or because it's part of technology is going to make a big impact. And uh, Shale, let's start with you. Give us a, a favorite company out there to look into. Outside our portfolio, obviously. Oh, you can you really can shout out an EIP company if you need to. It's okay. No, I can't. I can't pick one of our babies. Okay. I'll pick a company that's not in our portfolio. Uh, Sila Nanotechnologies is one of my favorites for a bunch of reasons. The CEO Gene Bertaszewski is a friend of mine, and he's just like an incredible rock star entrepreneur who's going to stop at nothing, and he's he, he's had to stop at nothing because they're building silicon anode uh, battery materials. Uh-huh. It turns out building battery materials takes a very long time and a lot of money. I mean, Rajesh mentioned QuantumScape before. It's another example. Example, the same thing. It's they've been at it for over a decade. What I like about Sila, amongst other things, is that they're shipping. They have product that is going into actual products today, which is a monumental feat in battery world. Uh, you know, given the history of battery companies, like once you start shipping at real commercial volumes. You've done something that deserves a lot of praise, so I will give that praise to Sila. No, I appreciate that. I think battery recycling tech is also incredibly interesting, and also different compounds inside of batteries for different usages. Just great stuff. Uh, Rajesh, quickly, uh, give us uh, a name of a company that we should all go look at. Uh, I'll pick my baby. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Just love them so much. Uh, it's a company called Vertigy. They're going after green hydrogen, but broadly, we are big believers in green hydrogen. Um, you know, that's going to impact a lot of industries from steel to, you know, overall uh, industrial decarbonization, all of that stuff. You know, it's, it's an example of an idea coming out of a completely different industry, disrupting a, a new industry like hydrogen. Totally love what they're doing. And I'm sure there are other good hydrogen companies as well, but it's a sector we love and a company we love. All right. Thank you. And then Mona, last word from you. Uh, give us a favorite to send us out. Um, I'll stick with the theme of emerging markets, and I will choose also one of um, USB companies. It's a company called Shift EV, and they've developed a process they called electrofitting, which is uh, retrofitting delivery fleets to make them electric. And they are doing that. The first market they are starting with is uh, Egypt. And the idea is that EVs, if you look at the price of new EVs in developed markets, they are expensive, exactly, um, while retrofitting um the many of existing fleets in emerging markets is a more viable option that's also um, competitive if you compare it to ICE. So you're not only asking, um, you're not expecting consumers to pay a pre- premium, which they shouldn't in emerging markets, but then actually you're providing them with uh, the benefit and um, cost savings. So yeah, that's a, our, my pick for today. All right. Well, we have to stop, but I want to say that I am uh, much more optimistic than I came into this now. And that's very encouraging because the planet is uh, literally our home. So thank you all for taking part, answering my questions and hanging out with everybody. And also, I hope that all of your investments make the world a better place, which is not usually how these chats go. So it's a lovely note to end on. And SOSV, thanks for having us. Thank you for a fun conversation. Thank you. Thanks a lot.